Ladies and gentlemen, Hans Zimmer. Evening all. What's the score? What's the score? Where were well, we the, at? The last time I looked, it was 1 0 to England. All right, OK, OK. <laughs> but we've had to turn our phones off, Hans, so we can't tell anyone. Yeah. No, no, OK. So. But should anybody be looking, please give us updates. <laughs> <laughs> There's some important Already, things already yeah. causing chaos. Uh, Hans, I mean, as, as I said before, we, we showed that, um, that reel. It's impossible to adequately cover a career like yours in 90 minutes, as we're going to attempt to do. Um, so well, inevitably, it's taken me a lifetime. Yes. <laughs> but inevitably, we'll pick, pick some, uh, some highlights out. out. And uh, what I've done is I've, I've chosen clips for a number of reasons, uh, always musically, but also perhaps their significance in the world of film music. Uh, and what happened afterwards, some sig significance to you, um, and also, of course, important collaborations and relationships that you've had in this business. Um, and we've got a lot to get, get through, so why don't we dive straight in? We're going to dive straight in with Rain Man, because really Rain Man was the film that launched you uh, as internationally, wasn't it? Where were you, and what were you doing before you got to Rain Man, or when you got Rain Man? Hang on, I, I did a film called The World Apart, and. It's a, it's a great movie. It's actually a wonderful movie, which um, very few people saw. But Diana Levinson, Barry Levinson's wife, saw it. And, you know, I'm always being very precise about this story. Because she went into HMV and bought him the CD. And he was over here um, promoting Good Morning Vietnam. And he didn't have my phone number, but he, somebody gave him the address for our studio down the Lily Road. And 11 o'clock at night, you know, there's a knock on the door. And, I'm opening a door and there's a guy standing there and he's going, hi, my name's Barry Levinson, pause. I'm a director and I'm thinking, yeah, you and my mum both, right? <laughs> um, but I see behind him there are these two, you know, remember those old Bentley limousines that nobody ever drove? So there were two of those squashed down our little alley. I thought, maybe he is. You know? <laughs> um, and so, so actually, quite recently I asked Barry if he ever saw a world apart. He never saw the film, but he just loved the music. And he sort of said, did I want to come to Hollywood? And he was actually really worried that I would say no and be some sort of European art snob as opposed to a complete whore. <laughs> uh, <laughs> turns out I'm a complete whore. But it, it proves, doesn't it, that you never quite know. Uh, you do some work, you never know who's going to be listening and who might pick it up. Um, Yes, I mean, that was, that was very lucky because actually, bef just sort of before that, just a few months before that, Tony Scott had actually offered me a big Hollywood movie called Revenge. Um, and his producer basically went, Hans who? You know, and, and, and you know, I was crestfallen, you know, it's like, so Barry took a chance on me. But I mean, you know, I think Tony and I, managed to do a few movies together after that. You know, after Rain Man, it was okay to mention my name. <laughs> yeah, we'll be coming to him uh, a little bit later. But you, you were struggling a little bit around this time, weren't you? You were trying to get work, you were trying to get money in, you had a fa family you'd, and all that kind of thing. Um, well, I had Maggie. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Maggie made sure... Um, hang on, they're, they're actually, they're, uh, you know, I... I, I this is a difficult audience. Let me just explain to you why you are a difficult audience, because I'm not entirely sure who's in the audience, but I know there are enough people in the audience that I can't lie about anything tonight. That's exactly right. Um, so Maggie made sure, um, you know, that my children, you know, my daughter had shoes, and um, uh, Roger Greenaway would invite me for a lunch on Sundays uh, so that I, I had one square meal a week, you know. <laughs> so, but, but, but really, I mean, it all started off with, with you know, Maggie asking this recording engineer at um, this recording studio in Fulham if he knew anybody who knew anything about synthesizers. And that's sort of how I, you know, it started. And I, uh, I was doing a lot of commercials. And I was working with Stanley Myers, who was really my mentor. So what was the brief for Rain Man? How did you approach it? Uh, but actually, the brief was really simple. We, we, I've done that on a few movies. I, um, so we made a list of what not to do. 
you know, because it's basically a road movie, and road movies in those days was either jangly guitars or sweeping strings. So we weren't going to do jangly guitars or sweeping strings. And I just thought it was interesting that this character was sort of so disoriented in the world, so that the music could be just this mashup of Cuban rhythms with crazy synth sounds and, you know, whatever. You know, it, it's it's foreign. Foreign was good, you know, <laughs> and, and I can get really foreign. <laughs> <laughs> well, let, well, let's have a look at the clip. This is when uh, Charlie, played by... Uh, Tom Cruise is taking uh, Raymond, played by yeah. Dustin Hoffman, uh, out of the institution that Raymond's yeah. been in for all this time, and they're going out together on their first little trip in the in the car. Let's have a look at the clip. First question has to be: Did you pitch that cue so that it was in the right key for Dustin Hoffman's humming? No, I sent the cue to Dustin in New York. <laughs> so, <laughs> so yeah, yeah. I, I mean, the the, the 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 sound of the bridge is in tune. You know, everything. You know, it's we're inside his crazy head. You know, um, I mean, one of the things which might be worth mentioning is that since I didn't know anybody in Los Angeles. Um, this was all written in Barry Levinson's office. So, you know, there was the cutting room and then there was my room with, you know, one synth in there. And, and what, what kind of synth? What kind of thing were you using? That would be bragging. It was the Fairlight. It was really great. Of course, you know, what else? Great. I was like, you know, it was like, you know, a big thing. Um, so, but, but Barry loved this idea and I loved this idea that we'd just be working on things together. And so, I mean, this scene is very collaborative, obviously, you know. And so far that everything is pitched, everything is... It's not so much that it's cut to the music, but it's, it's, it's obviously the music shaped the scene and the, the scene shaped the music. And did you have a feeling when you were doing it? Because I know that when you arrived in, in Hollywood, you were a bit shocked by the, the way technolo technologically they were a little bit behind what you were used to. What do you mean they were behind? World? You know, I mean, I, I thought Hollywood... Well, we all thought, you know, we all think Hollywood, that must be it. You know, they, they, they have all the technology, they have everything and all that stuff. Uh, no, when I, when I arrived there, it was, I mean, I'm sorry, we were far more advanced doing things here, you know, using synthesizers, using electronics. The systems were really um, not antiquated. Well, it, yeah, I suppose it was antiquated, but the idea that you could go and make a sound on the spot or that you could write a score in an office as opposed to the, the, the whole idea was you know you had to write it on paper you have to give it to the orchestrator and then the first time the director would really hear it would be with the full orchestra there and he'd go i don't really like this and then you know everybody would go crazy because they'd send the orchestra home and it would be a complete rewrite and so everything was like a compromise and at the same time a heart attack and this was like just guys casually working. I mean, I remember 
figuring, you know, Mark Johnson, who was the producer on this, didn't really know what a producer did. So all he did was endlessly get us, you know, junk food. I mean, you know, that's, oh, that's what the producer does. You know, he feeds the, he feeds the composer. Okay. It's a very important yeah, role. Yeah, absolutely. So we, we were, I don't know, we were living off, you know, a barbecue ribs forever. But did you have a feeling that this, this was it? This was going to be the... the no, no, no. I mean, um, if you think about this movie, it's, it's a strange movie to become successful. You know, it's like, there's no car chase in it. It's, it's a, there's no real love story. It's, it's got a very ambiguous ending. Actually, it's got a truthful ending, you know, because in the... Oh, there was the other thing, which was... Um, the script is really quite different from how the movie is because uh, Barry, of course, shaped it in his way, which, which is, you know, so, so I would say, well, what about this bit in the script? And he goes, well, that's not in the movie. So, so, so the, 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 the script I read was nothing like the movie, you know, which is perfect. <laughs> um, we'll move on to another film some years later. Um, you've mentioned him already, director Tony Scott. The film is Crimson Tide. And the reason I've chosen this is really because this a lot of people point at this score as being the beginning of a certain kind of scoring, a certain kind of style that you have been, are attached to very, very much so, I mean, having kind of invented it. Um, and we're going to look at a scene that, that in, incorporates that style very much so. Um, but here you had um, essentially just come off winning an Oscar for The Lion King, very different film to Crimson Tide, shall we say. Um, and we'll see a little bit of Lion King later on. Um, what about this influence over the future of film scoring at this moment? You presumably weren't thinking, right, that's it, I'm going to change film scoring in this film. No. But what were you thinking? No, actually, I, I, I probably, you yeah, know, it's interesting that you mentioned the Oscar thing, so that probably will describe it the best. I won an Oscar for Lion King. I shouldn't have won an Oscar for Lion King because Shawshank Redemption was nominated in the same year, and that's the better <laughs> score. But I won an Oscar, and it was a crazy night hanging out with Elton and flirting with Claudia Schiffer in German, and nobody could understand it, and being up until five o'clock in the morning. And then I had a meeting with Tony Scott and Jerry Bruckheimer, and I played them a cue from Crimson Tide, and they said it was absolute shit. Um, and, and so it puts everything into perspective. Do you know what I mean? It's like, yeah, yeah. hey, wait, wait, just, just a few hours ago, I was, you know, like holding the golden doodah, right? And, 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 and the next moment, it's just like, roll up your sleeves, go and, you know, go and do it. Um, no, I, it wasn't about reinventing film music. I just thought that this was a, appropriate for the movie. And I, I, I remember... <clears throat> like coming up with the idea of the choirs because it's just because I just actually I like the Ru Russians better than you know so, so uh, <laughs> and and I remember Jerry Brockhammer just being appalled by this idea and us fighting every day we would come to the studio and we'd have this argument about the choirs and I th and after a while I thought if if I was this producer I'd fire my sorry ass. But he actually cared enough to, to hang in there in this conversation. You know, Tony and me wanting to do the choir. And, and I, I remember Jerry saying, you're not doing an art movie here. And us, we, we knew that. But at the same time, we, wanted, we just had this ambition. We just had these ideas. And what Jerry made me do by questioning everything is he actually made me really think it through. So... Um, weirdly, this you know, the, the, uh, you know, a little resistance to the stupid ideas is sometimes a good thing. Simpson, Don Simpson, and, yeah. and Jerry Brockheimer, they they often come in for a lot of criticism with the kind of thing that they did, and yet their movies show they really knew what exactly what they were oh, doing, absolutely. stylized, yeah. why, and the directors that they used in order to do what it is that they wanted. What I mean, there are more stories about Don Simpson than almost anybody in Hollywood, aren't there? Yeah, but how I, did you find? Okay, let me give you one one story about so the. F I start, all right, so I didn't get to do Revenge, because, but Tony hired me on his next movie, which was Days of Thunder, maybe not a, you know, the masterpiece we all hoped for. Um, but what, what was really interesting was um, Don, Don and Jerry would come and listen to the music, and they would come in and they'd listen to a piece, and there'd be this 20-second silence, and then Don would give this very articulate 
criticism or ideas or whatever, just a perfect paragraph. And after a couple of weeks of this, I sort of went, you know, what's with the silence? And he said, look, I know you spent time thinking about this piece of music before you presented it to us, so I think I should have the respect to actually think about my, uh, you know, what I'm going to say to you. And so whatever you say about Don, he was incredibly creative and he was very, very, you know, respectful of the crazy people in the room. <laughs> so let's set up Crimson Tide then. I mean, it, it, this is where this combination of the driving drum rhythms, the percussive strings, and then the, the big horn lines that almost became your signature. This is where it, it kind was of very, starts. very long ago. Okay. Yeah, 1995. <laughs> All right. <laughs> um, so just talk me through how you did then approach, approach that film. Can you remember all those years ago? Well, well, I mean, we're talking about, a re in the film, we're talking yeah, about a, re a relationship between two guys who are well, different sides of the tracks, as it were, with their views on nuclear war. Well, well look, the, the, the film is really a play. It's a two-header, you know. It's, it's, it, it pretends to be an action movie, which it absolutely isn't. It's just, it's just a theatre play. Or it, it, it could be just on us, could be just you and me, Tommy. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. I, I mean, <laughs> so it really... The, the, the part of what the music had to do is it had to sort of give you that sense of, of some sort of epicness, but at the same time it had to give you that sense that, that above your head was tons and tons and tons of water. So, the, the, so there's a suppressive quality about the whole thing. And I just like the agility of Denzel, where both of the performances. Yeah. I mean, you got, you got two of the greatest actors on the screen, so you don't really want to go and... <sighs> distract from that too much. Well, this scene is near the beginning of the film. It's before they've it's, got to yeah. loggerheads. Right. This is a famous scene in the rain when um, Gene Hackman's character right. is giving a speech to his men, uh, geeing them up yeah. for their mission. And, and, and as usual with Tony, there's like, you know, go have sparks. Fly. You know, I mean, just watch the way it's lit. It's just beautifully yeah, it lit. Is, it is amazing. Yeah. Here we go. Expect and demand your very best. Anything less, you should have joined the Air Force. <laughs> this might be our Commander in Chief's Navy, but this is my boat. And all I ask is that you keep up with me. And if you can't, that strange sensation you'll be feeling in the seat of your pants will be my boot in your ass. Qualification for command. Uh, my last breath of polluted air for the next 65 days. I'm gonna miss it. If I don't trust air, I can't see. <laughs> this 
my favorite part. Right here, right now. Bravo, Hunter. Sir? You knew to shut up and enjoy the view. Most eggheads want to talk it away. You stocked this one up a couple of points. Thanks. I think every composer that sat in that chair has said that often it's not the script, it's not the way it's shot, it's the performance that can often give them the inspiration for the music. I, you've got two awesome performances nah, out there. You've got awesome performances, but all that goes through my mind is Tony. And you know, like the, 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 the white shot of the submarine that's stoned uh, because we didn't get permission to film the submarines, and so Tony went out with a helicopter, you know, and, and just grabbed that shot when the SS Alabama was leaving harbor in Hawaii. Um, dialogue, no, nobody really knows this. It's, ghosted by T uh, Quentin Tarantino mm -hmm. and Alabama becomes a main character in True Romance so you know and it's Tony it's to Tony would inspire us all all the time by just his I don't know he was just one of a kind he certainly was um, so this was really the moment where a lot of directors and producers started to say I want my scores to sound like that. I want my scores to sound like Hans Zimmer's scores. Can if I you... brag and drop names at the same time? I not so want to, to do that. Uh, by the way, what's the score? No, never mind. Uh, <laughs> I was working in San Francisco on another movie and I got a phone call. Oh, somebody said, it's Steven Spielberg on the phone for you. And, you know, and I'm going, oh, bloody hell, it's Steven Spielberg on the phone for me. <laughs> Just the way you do, right? Um, <laughs> And it was Stephen who I hadn't met at this point, and he, he started off by saying, you've ruined my day. And I'm going, well, you know, this must be somewhat worrisome. He said, I've listened to Crimson Tide eight times now in a row, and I realized it's an hour and five minutes long each time. So, you know, my day is gone. All I've been doing is listening to the score all day and didn't get any work done. So I think that was a compliment. I think you might be right yeah. there. <laughs> but what about from you, your perspective? Because you, you've, you've done so many different kinds of movie. There, there must be a pressure often on you from directors to say, I'd quite like you to do that bit, that again in your movie. But I know you, I, I know you, quite, you want to be creative. You want to find new ways of doing things. Event, no, no, hang on. Directors will say to you, I want something new. And executives at the studio say, I want something new. And then you take them by the word and you do something new and you play to them and you see that sort of <laughs> moment of them going, well, how, it's a bit too new. Right? <laughs> um, and, and you realize they're absolutely right. You need to give people a little bit of time to get used to things. And, and sometimes, I mean, I, I remember on Sherlock, um, <laughs> It was Warner Brothers' big Christmas movie, and it, it's fiddles, banjo, and accordions. So maybe that was a bit, you know, not quite what they expected. And so there was a little bit of a, a guy loved it, you know, he, uh, but there was a bit of a conversation. And, and I mean, the way I solve these conversations is actually very simple. Uh, because sitting in a room, you know, just like with Bundle for Executives, or director and composer and producer, is not really an optimum viewing experience. So, the, the, I, because music is indefensible, I can't actually say to you, I can't explain to you why you should like this piece of music. It either resonates with you or it doesn't. Mm. But the circumstances are important. So what, what I do is, if there's a question about anything, I say, let's put it in front of an audience. Um, <laughs> I, I mean, I'm, I, God, I remember too many occasions where, you know, that stuff happened. But, I mean, Sherlock is a good, good example where we previewed it in, in Phoenix, Arizona. So that's actually a relatively short flight from L.A., but it's a really long flight when there's a guy sitting across from you saying, you're ruining the movie. You're ruining it for everybody. <laughs> and we get to the screening, and we're in the screening, and I'm sitting next to a woman. I have no idea who she is, just an audience member. And we get to the most contentious bit, and she turns to me and she goes, that's genius. 
I'm going, tell him, tell him. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, you know, and, and, and our numbers were higher on the flight back. I couldn't help going, so do you want me to tell you? Know, do you want me to? I'll change it. Happy. No, 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 don't touch it. Yeah. So, but because I know it's a different experience if you have a room full of people. But presumably also with your... And, and of course, we are pretending you're not here and it's just Tommy and I yeah, having... it's just like us, a, yeah, as always. Right. Um, but presumably with your use of technology, from, e from even very early days, for you it was a little bit easier in a sense to demonstrate before demos necessarily became a, a word to, to them what it might sound like as opposed to a composer that was only writing on on uh, paper well, and yeah, then playing it on the piano. No, absolutely. Well, I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a terrible piano player. I'm not John Williams. I mean, I, you know, I, I did get to know Steven Spielberg a little bit beyond that. And of course, I used every opportunity to go, so how does it work with John? How do you guys work? You know, like, <laughs> because you want to know. You yeah. want to know how the master works. And yes, John is an extraordinarily competent pianist um, on top of being a genius. Um, but it is, you know, and this is where the French horns come in, da da da. And then, so the first time you really have a proper conversation is with the orchestra in the room. And I always thought, we have all this great technology, why don't we use it to at least show where the French horns come in, even though if, if they sound like shitty samples or whatever. You know, eventually something will happen that will, I mean, you, you can have a collaborative conversation, mm. you know. Um, uh, beyond, uh, uh, so I, I treat the orchestra very differently. I don't treat the orchestra as that thing where the director hears it for the first time and it all falls apart because it all falls apart. I don't make changes once the orchestra is up on the stage. It's entirely about getting a performance out of them. You know, and it is about, and hey, I'm pretty good at programming synth and I can, I can make a pretty convincing noise and so, <laughs> I love throwing sort of out... an understatement. No, 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 here, no, no, but, but, but I love throwing out the challenge to the orchestra, going, okay, guys, have a listen to this. This is just me. So now bring your passion, bring your emotion, and, and do that thing, you know, do that thing that you do, because orchestras are an expensive hobby, and I've said it a thousand times, but I'm going to just say it one more time. Whatever you say about the film business or Hollywood, the, the dastardly nature of it, the, you know, everything is true, but it commissions orchestral music on a daily basis, and that's important on so many levels, because if we lose the orchestra, it's not just we lose the history of our humanity, I think we'll actually lose a chunk of our humanity. Absolutely right. Um, let's move all the way from Tony Scott to his brother, Ridley, talking about uh, collaborations. Uh, there was Thelma and Louise, but I had a little quote from, that Ridley said about you. He said, in my head, I listen to Hans's music and I don't even have to shut my eyes. I can see the pictures. He responds to pictures. Now, we're moving towards Gladiator to talk about Gladiator. How did the relationship work? Let, let's say the difference between working with Tony Scott and with Ridley Scott. Well, the difference is that with Tony, it was literally just the most... <laughs> Fabulous creative chaos. I mean, okay, so here, here's the difference. Tony would say to me, have you ever ridden on a motorbike through the desert at night? I'm going, I don't ride motorbikes. He goes, no, 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 you've got to come along. You've got to listen to the desert at night. And that would be his way of explaining something. Ridley would phone me at 9 o'clock in the morning because he knows I'm still asleep. And he'd go, hey, do you want to do a gladiator movie? And I'd start laughing and go, what, men in skirts? <laughs> He'd go, no, it's not that sort of a gladiator movie. And the pictures thing is very important because I, I learned actually on Gladiator never to, don't read the script, don't read the script on a Ridley Scott film. Go to dinner with Ridley and get him to tell you the story because then you figure out what, what's important for him. And because he's such an amazing artist, he, he inevitably at a certain point will take the pen out and start drawing the scenes for you. So um, you get to see the movie unfold before your eyes because the way he draws is the way he will shoot the scene. Mm. So not, not so bad. I mean, he went to, he went to the Royal Academy um, you know, he, he, from up north, you know, it was him and, and, and there was like this other 
northern chap there, but I, everybody else was like rich and dressed in purple velvet and stuff like this. And, um, and so he was, the other guy was sort of earning a bit of money on the side, you know, washing up beer mugs, etc. But one day, Ridley looked over his shoulder and realized that he needed to, he, he Ridley was never going to be the painter. This guy was, and that was David Hogney. And that's really what persuaded Ridley that he had to go and look, broaden his gaze and look somewhere else. Hmm. Um, there's only five years between uh, Crimson Tide and Gladiator, but the technology, of course, around about that time really did develop. And, but what's interesting about Gladiator, of course, is it, it's a fairly traditional, traditionally scored film, isn't it? With big orchestra. Um, I know there's other elements within it. And, of course, we must talk about Lisa Gerard as a very important vocal element in it, but it actually it's a fairly traditional score in, in that sense. Uh, it's traditional, it's, it's a bit of a mess. I mean, um, <laughs> I couldn't, uh, again, you know, like, like Rain Man, Gladiator, the, the cutting room and my studio, they cut in my studio, which made it really collaborative and very interactive. But very early on, um, we had this conversation that there was absolutely no female soul in the movie. Um, I remember Pietro had the, uh, Pietro, Pietro Scalia, the editor. He had three CDs standing on his little desk, and he picked the first one up and he went, "You know, what about Lisa Gerard?" And um, Ridley and I just went, "Yeah, that's okay. You know, sounds like a good <laughs> idea." And I phoned him. It's, a, it's too long a story to tell you, but um, that whole opening—I mean, obviously that does not exist in the script because what, what would be the first thing you would cut for budget? One minute of an, it's not even Russell's hand, an extra's hand on, on the wheat. You oh, you've, re, you've totally spoiled it now. <laughs> he doesn't, I, I can go, do you want me to do worse? Do you know, like at the end, when he dies and he goes through Elysium skates, Ridley had that image in his head. He knew he had seen the gates to heaven somewhere. And he thought it was in Tuscany, so he sent the scouts out to Tuscany, he wasn't there. He thought it was in Spain, wasn't in Spain. He thought it might have been, because we shot a lot of it down in Farnham, you know, just by Guildford. Yeah. Um, he thought it was there. And then finally he remembered, it's the cruise toilet in Malta. <laughs> All right, so the gates to heaven. Did I, did I now ruin this for you for good? Totally. Okay, good. I did know about the battle scene. I always think of that when you're going down that big A road uh, out of Surrey. Right, exactly. Just to the right, right, I think, is where the whole yeah. of the battle scene was done at the beginning yeah. of the film, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. No, and, and, and you know, that like, the, like that really big guy who holds up the head and he's shouting something? I can, and Ridley says, he's, he's the German. I said, I can't understand that. What, what was he saying? <laughs> and finally, Ridley said, well, he's a Scottish actor. And then I understood it. <laughs> he's going, Schweinehunde, but with a Scottish accent. <laughs> <laughs> you know, <I> like, yeah. <laughs> well, look, um, the scene that I've picked is, is near the end. It's the climax, I suppose, really, of the, of the film in, in uh, that uh, Commodus, played by Joaquin Phoenix, uh, finally gets to battle uh, Maximus played by Russell Crowe, in the arena to the death, of course. A uh, battle that's kind of been brewing from the very beginning, really, of the film. Um, so that's the scene, but it, it builds, and there's another one of those scenes, actually, we have a few of them tonight, that, that builds, uh, starts small and builds. I like and a good Pasacal, yeah. Oh, yes. <laughs> so let's have a look at the scene, and then we'll, then we'll discuss it. I knew a man who once said death smiles at us all. All a man can do is smile back. I wonder, did your friend smile at his own death? You must know. He was your father. You loved my father, I know. But so did I. That makes us brothers, doesn't it? Smile for me now, brother. <laughs> Strap on his armor. Conceal the wound.
that, that's a real hair on the back of the neck moment for me, that one. And uh, I, that must also be a product of what you were talking about being in the same or next door to the editor, that all of that works uh, musically. Everything works exactly right musically, and the cuts come with, with the music. So is that how it worked? Would it, like, for example, with a big landing on the bass note, where we see a, that, that wider shot of, the, of all of those amazing shields yeah, coming yeah. up. Um, I mean, it was very much hand in hand. Uh, you know, it's, it's a, 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 the, the hardest thing was I had written this crazy, you know, the battle stuff. I mean, that was incredibly complex. And every time the cut changed, Pietro very kindly cut in four bar chunks. So yeah. I could sort of go and figure it out. But, um, but not, that's great, isn't it? No, because no, no, that no. doesn't always happen. Though. Well, but it's just, that's how we're supposed to be doing this stuff together. Yeah. You know, it's supposed to be collaborative. But there's going to be lots of people here who don't have that experience at all. But but <laughs> but but the but the, the only thing that stops you from having experience is well, in this case, uh, make sure you have some decent red wine um, <laughs> around. And uh, no, 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 you just just invite invite your collaborators in. You know, and they invite you in. I mean, um, I think one of the advantages I have is that I don't have a formal musical education. So I'm never going to fall prey to using words that are incomprehensible to a director, like allegro or, you know, you know, pizza. Actually, yeah. Chris Nolan always uh, like made it a thing of on each movie learning a new musical term that he could sort of <laughs> casually drop in on the dub stage. <laughs> you know, pizzicato. <laughs> yeah. um, so no, but I mean it, it's 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 story. We're talking about story. How are we going to tell the story? Plus, I mean, look, I haven't listened to this since we did it. Um, you know, I'm going oh. The German accent is really strong. It is. You know, it it's is. Like, you know I well, mean, it's certainly Wagner, the Wagner. You know, can't, yeah, 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 you know, of course. Sorry, can't help it. Um, <laughs> but it, how's just, the, just how's like the football going? <laughs> Never mind. Just, just like with well, the Germans aren't in it. Don't, just like you, yeah. uh, uh, you did it after Crimson Tide, um, where you sort of set uh, uh, a, a um, style that everybody then wanted to, to recreate. Exactly the same thing happened here with Gladiator, didn't it? And particularly with the use of Lisa Gerard's well, voice, because suddenly there were, yeah, but, for want but, of a phrase, wailing women over every movie. I, for I know. Ages and but ages. But they were just and wailing women. No, the, Lisa Gerard is singular, you know? And, 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 and I think it's really important to point out that it wasn't just any wailing woman. It was <laughs> not Lee, in this one. No, in this there one. There were lots of images. Yeah, you know, then, then, then there were the lesser. Hmm. Wailing women, as it were. <laughs> um, uh, no, 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 and, and, and it was it was fantastic because because the I mean the way we worked was, it was I mean, literally in my room, couch behind me, Ridley sitting there smoking big cigars, me going, he's ruining her voice, um, Lisa with a microphone, uh, the picture up, and we just we just try things up against the picture, and uh, I remember. The scene, you know, where Russell comes home and finds that his wife has been killed. And we had thought we'd done something like, extraordinary. And we played it to Ridley. He said, no, it's not really working for me. And <laughs> so this turned into this whole conversation, like at 2 o'clock in the morning, after she was poisoned by more cigar smoke than you can <laughs> imagine. Um, Lisa went, OK, fine, I'm going to have one more go. And, you know, and she was pretty uh, wound up at that point. And I remember we just put the scene up, you know, me playing to it, and, you know, and, and she just laid into it, you know. And it was the most amazing performance. It was, I mean, it came, from, it came from a place that, you know, just an extraordinary place, but I'm not sure you want to go and know where that place is somehow. Yeah, it's like it was yeah. so dark. Yeah. Yeah, and, and I turned around, and it's, I said, <laughs> Ridley's just like, <laughs> and I'm going, how's that? And he's going, <laughs> so, so, but that's what you want to do. You, that's, that's the job. You want to pin your director in his seat. You, it's not our job as composers isn't to do what they tell you to do. Our job is to surprise them. Our, sub, our job is to do the stuff they can't imagine. You know, that's, you know, and, and, and if you work with great directors, they love that. You know, never thought about it that way. That's the best compliment you can get. But the, one of the reasons I bring up about this 
influence about setting something up and then everybody wants to imitate it is is that you get you often get the blame for a lot of things that happen in in films right, so by lot, starting I, yeah. it and then going off and doing something it. else and meanwhile everybody else is trying to do that one thing but how you you know this you know that people do often blame you for, for a lot of these stylistic things and also because you have such influence in in, in Los Angeles and over the industry what do you feel about that? What, what do you feel about you, you? You're making a face, but you know um, it's the truth. But but what do you feel about that? When people say, "Oh, it's all Hans Zimmer's fault that we've all got these big driving strings and the synths going and all that," I mean, what what else can you do? You know, by that? the time everybody's doing the driving strings, I'm doing thin red light, and then everybody's doing thin red light. I mean, I I, I once. <laughs> In one week, I saw six different movies tempt the Thin Red Line. One was an urban crime thing, one was an animated comedy. I can't remember what the other ones were, but the same piece. You know, um, look, all, all that happened is I, I just wrote what I felt, you know, and, and what I felt like, and what I felt like writing, you know, I mean, seriously. So, um, I, I'm not trying to set any trends, nor am I trying to ruin music or the film business or anything. <laughs> Actually, no, film and business should be separated. You know, mm. it's like um, John Williams once said to me, you know, the words music and supervision should never be uh, uttered in the same breath. You know, um, I, I think he has a point. But, but no, but it's, 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 I don't know, it, it's just, I go and do something, and by the time everybody else does it, I mean, Chris and all, the, the, a perfect example is, you know, when we did Batman Begins, James Dean Hutton and I, when we did Batman Begins with Chris, we never, we never thought we were going to do another Batman movie. I mean, I spent forever getting rid of notes, so it would just be this two-note motif, you know, it's like, you have no idea how hard it is suddenly to do the second and the third movie if you, since I didn't, you know, um, since I limited my material or my identity to, su to such a small thing. And then everybody else was sort of, whatever you want to call it, um, in being influenced by, you know, a complete lack of, you know, I mean, like, you know, the, 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 the tiny fragment of minimalist nonsense I was sort of doing. Um, so by the time we got to the second movie, I mean, the audience doesn't care if it sounds like me or everybody else who's been sort of slightly borrowing from this very simple idea. Um, suddenly we were sounding old, you know, so by the time we got to Interstellar, we actually sat down and we made a list of what have we done and what haven't we done. You know, and that's partly how the church organ thing came about. Well, we'll, we'll talk about that. Right. We, you, we'll, we'll get a little bit ahead of ourselves. Let's, let's stop before instead and come to Inception. Um, oh, oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's all my fault that everything goes... Yeah. It absolutely <laughs> is your fault. No! I'm glad, I'm glad you brought that up. <laughs> well, 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 no, no. Here is a very important <laughs> distinction to be made. It's in the script, and I'm not blaming Chris, I'm saying something different. It's a story point, as opposed to just a convenient way in a trailer to do a non sequitur. And yeah, it's a really impressive sound. I mean, it's, it's, it's um, you know, the Thursday afternoon, and I hadn't written anything, and we were at Air Studios with a bunch of brass players and a piano with a brick on the pedal, and that's yeah. that, you know? When, when you say a bunch of brass players, normally that, for you, means 18 to 20 no. trombones, doesn't <laughs> no, it? No, it was... You, do, you used a lot... How many brass players do you use on Inception? I have no idea, but well, it uh, was... A, it, I know the answer. It, it was, was a, a lot. It was a lot, right. <laughs> Most yeah. of them, in fact, Yeah. in London. Um, we had quite a few, yes. Yeah. Yes. Um, plenty, but, but no, but... Uh, but, but, but there wasn't, you know, I mean, there, there was an idea. There, there absolutely was an idea. I mean, everything, story comes first. Story comes, uh, Inception, look, Inception is, Inception, this is how Inception started. Chris phoned me up uh, going, hey, do you want to take the kids to the beach? So we're both sitting on the beach watching our kids, and he's going, got this idea. 
for this movie. And I realized as he's telling me the idea that this might be intellectually somewhat tricky for an audience to follow. And so, so I, you know, and maybe, maybe he was a little worried about that too. Yeah, so I just tried to write a piece, I, I tried to write music which in a funny way was reassuring to the audience that even if you didn't get it, the music was like a river and you were in this little boat and sometimes it gets a bit bumpy and sometimes it gets a bit boring or whatever it does, but you are on a journey and you're going to get to the end of the journey and all I promise you, it's all going to be all right, you know, or whatever, you know, it's, you're going to have an experience, you know. The, I mean, the, we could spend the rest of the night discussing the story of Inception. I don't think it's even worth us attempting too much. But one thing we should say ahead of the, uh, of the clip, and, and I'm sure everyone knows this who's seen it, but the, one of the key songs, or the key song in the film, is the Edith Piaf, yeah. Je ne regrette rien. Which, which, we ne which nearly didn't have. I mean, a, f a few, you know, this, this is where it's sort of, once he cast Marion Cotillard, who had played Edith Piaf, you know, we then questioned ourselves, would people think we were being sort of self-reverential or, or, you know, or whatever. And then the next thing that happened was that um, one has quite rightly said, to shoot in Paris is very expensive. Can't you shoot these scenes in England? And I remember saying to Chris, as soon as you say the word Paris, as soon as you do one shot of Paris, it's actually a great way of saving money because everybody will know that somewhere in there is some great tragic love story. And you, so all you have to do is you have to have one shot in Paris and it'll serve story forever. Um, so yes, it did, the song nearly didn't happen. And there's, right in the beginning of the intro, there's a the, the, the trombones do a ba ba. And in the script, it was, you know, the, the, to show time stretched out that that the, those two trombone notes would become, I mean, it's the easiest trick in the world. You know, it's like, <laughs> slow it down. And someone discovered it and put it on YouTube and said, I've discovered what Hans Zimmer does in this and it slow, massively slowed down the introduction of Edith Piaf. And your response was, I can't believe it took them so long to I notice. know, because, because we were trying to make a story point and, and we had failed because you didn't, nobody got it until yeah. this guy put it on YouTube. You know. Okay, but this, yeah. this clip, um, again, there's no real point explaining it because it's too complicated and those that have seen Inception will know. But the reason I've, I've chosen this, obviously, it's, it's a very dramatic section, but also it contains the uh, elements of that uh, slowed down uh, Je ne regret rien. I but have also, no idea what you picked. And also the boam bit right. that you have already mentioned. So let's have a look at this clip.
as is traditional with anything connected with you, I think we've just blown the subwoofer. <laughs> Good. Uh, <laughs> that is, it, I mean, the, the music all the way through is it's extraordinary. It's so original in the way that in which it's used. And I think that's a much testament not just to you, but also the way Chris, in which you yeah. work with Chris Nolan. But it, it was written parallel to the movie. It wasn't actually written to the movie. It was written while Chris was shooting. Mm. Um, and then there came the point, of course, where he finished shooting. And I said, oh, OK, can, can I have the movie now to, to, to you know, write to him? went. No, this is going pretty well. Just finish the score first, and then we'll. And then we did a second pass, sort of adjusting things. But most of it was written, um, just, just really, just from that discussion we had on the beach, or seeing fragments, or watching, you know, uh, looking at design, and and just. So freedom then. It's yeah, freedom completely. I mean, I mean, you know, like like, I heard this. Not the ram, you know, forget that. Uh, <laughs> but I heard this other sound in my head for like for three days. I was trying to figure out what it was. And finally I figured out what it was. It was Johnny Ma. It's not an electric guitar, right? It's Johnny Ma because you need to have the person playing it. You, you wanna... So I remember phoning Chris and I said to him, you have to listen to this whole paragraph before you say no. The worst thing in film music is electric guitars and orchestra. It's absolutely awful. But if I said, what about orchestra and Johnny Ma, what would you say? And he said, give him a ring. You know, so <laughs> that's how that came about, because I, I heard Johnny's sound, and I couldn't, it took me a while to, you know, oh, that's what that is, yeah. Yeah. Well, the, and he's just one of the many collaborators you've worked with. I, you know, it's not just not just talking about directors here. There's a lot of musical collaborators that you love working with. Yeah, no, because 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 it's uh, you know, look, the, the the thing I've learned over the years is is that there's a shorthand for composers or for musicians where they go the strings, the brass, etc. It's not that. It's individuals that make up that string section, and you do want to go and pick your individual players. Because they bring, you know, if, they bring something to the. I mean, they literally bring something to the party. You know, it's you're like, very loyal, so, aren't you? To uh, I mean, it, so many of the musicians that work with you in the studio, particularly in air studios, right. they're the same musicians that have worked with you for years and years and years. Yes, I mean, well, actually, was it Inception? Yeah, it was Inception. We we had a problem, a, a huge problem. We had booked our sessions at air, and we couldn't go because remember when the Volcano blew up in Iceland. Oh yeah. Right. So we'd booked these sessions, and we could have gotten there. But I said to Chris, "What if the volcano blows again? We can't get back." So we had rigged up this whole thing, loads of cameras at air and loads of microphones, and actually I could hit the talkback button in my studio in LA and talk to them. Um, but we really quickly noticed that if we hadn't known these musicians, it wouldn't have worked because. You, you hear the sound of Mary Scully saying something, you know it's Mary asking the question. You have On base. To, you know, and yeah, and, and they, they, they are our collaborators, they are our family. I mean, you know, they're, they're it's, 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 why are we loyal to them? Because they've been loyal to us. I mean, they give, you know, uh, we've put them through some stuff difficult times <laughs> trust me dunkirk is not for the fader <laughs> <laughs> okay um the next clip i've put in because it's huge fun and i remember when i first saw it which actually was at the premiere and i thought it was the, one of the most outrageous i mean even by your standards completely outrageous section uh and this is in sherlock holmes a game of shadows when sherlock holmes played by oh robert downey jr and Watson, Jude Law, and they go to the opera because they're trying to find a bomb, which, as it turns out, isn't in there, just to give it away a little bit. But playing in the opera house is Don Giovanni, but it's Don Giovanni by Mozart as scored by Hans Zimmer. <laughs> and this is a scene where you are having a lot of fun in this scene. So I thought I'd throw it in because it is a lot of fun. Let's, talk about, let's watch it, and then we'll talk about it afterwards. Sorry.
I was mistaken. What? I made a mistake. don't know Don Giovanni, it doesn't normally sound like that. I, it, it's thrilling. I mean, it must it, be fun working with Guy Ritchie on stuff like that. It was it in completely. the script? How, how yeah, well, of work? course it was in the script. Of yeah. course it was in the script. And uh, um, there's a lot of uh, Schubert as well in the script. I mean, uh, you know, I told you earlier about that little problem about on the first Sherlock movie, how they didn't like the music. Mm -hmm. Well, it's because I had all these Roma or gypsy violins going on. And it uh, nearly got me fired. Uh, guy loved it, you know, but it, it nearly got me fired. And it was really funny opening the script for the second one. This is the second one. And the first page is the gypsy camp. And I'm going, oh, come on, guys. <laughs> you know? But it's like success is the best revenge, you know? <laughs> it's, um, so, so, yeah. Um, you can't show this movie in Germany without getting beheaded, you know, I mean, you're, you're like, you're doing serious damage there to Mozart. I am doing serious damage. I, you know, I grew up with you. Actually, if I think about it, I went to my first Mozart opera when I was two and a half years old, and it sounded that big, do you know what I mean? Yes. So this, this was just making it the way I remembered it as a kid. It's huge and amazing and bombastic and those diminished chords are fantastic and, oh yes. you know, don't get to use those a lot these days all right we're, we're going to end uh with a main clip with uh, interstellar so we're back with christopher nolan again now this again is an op was an opportunity given to you by chris to be creative away from the film itself wasn't it this famous one you page know, you, thing you, you, you get yeah. Do you, do you all know the story or do I have to tell it again? Who doesn't know the story? Everybody knows the story. <laughs> Good. All right. It's that. <laughs> right. Well, he, he gave you a concept <laughs> rather than anything about a relationship. Yeah, he knew yeah. how to press your buttons, didn't he, to get them to get the creative juices. No, going. yeah. It's, I mean, the, 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 the movie is about the relationship between a father and his daughter. And Chris had written something for me, typewritten. And it's only afterwards that I looked at... You know, he very carefully whited out the R and her, so it became he. So he was writing about my relationship with my son, Jake, who he knows very well. Because we've been, you know, do you want to go to the beach and discuss it? <laughs> Inception. Um, so, yes, it, we, we inevitably, I think anything and everything I've ever written, the only place I know how to come from is it has to be extraordinarily personal. Um, because I have no technique and I have no formal education. So the only thing I know how to write about is something that is inside me. And Chris knows this and he is 
crafty and taps right into that, you know. And 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 yes, I mean, I've I've never shown anybody the letter, and I will never show anybody le the letter, because it's extraordinarily candid and personal, and it's in extraordinarily true to my relationship with my son. It's the sound world of Interstellar which I find so striking. The combination of instruments, and particularly, of course, the use of the church organ. So how did that come about? Why was that such an important sound? For you? Uh, I mean, the, the, the trivial answer, but it, it, it is a trivial answer, is because of the way the stuff we had done in Babylon or Inception had sort of traveled into somehow into other movies, we sat down and we went, you know, what haven't we done? And Chris at one point just said, pipe on. And as soon as he said it, I, I, and I grew up, it's a long story, but I grew up in, in a house that uh, just around the corner there was a house that had a pipe on. So I grew up mm. as a kid playing one of those things. But I just remember the shape, which is, you know, that those big organ pipes are just like rockets mm -hmm. themselves. And I thought it was incredibly appropriate. Um, and my, my only fear was, you know, oh, oh God, it's going to sound like a bad hammer house of horror. You know, do, do you mean it's like that? That's the connotation you have to pipe on. Um, and I thought, I'm, but but that'll be an interesting challenge. You know, let's see if we can't go and sort of increase the vocabulary a little bit. And did you write sort of almost sweets? Of music, which could then be fashioned into the film. How, how did it all, actually work? Yeah, no, it was again. It was all written. It was all written away from the picture, and then recrafted to fit the picture. I mean, the, um, the Chris doesn't cut film to music. We we uh, Interstellar is a really good example of. Um, there was there was one. He he was shooting in Iceland, and he was phoning me here in London. He's going, I want to try, I, I'm going to give you a set of um, scenes and I just want you to see if you can write something. And it was very complicated and had to hit this cut and then it had to hit this and da da da, da. And, and I'm going, Chris, I don't think I can do this. I think I need the footage. And he goes, well, just give it a go. I mean, let's see how we do. Because in the past, our sense of how long a scene is or how long a shot should be held has always been really the same. So I wrote this super complicated and it goes from here to there to there and send it over to Iceland um, and phone him and I said, so, so how does it work? And he goes, it, it, hits, it hits everything. It's, you know, we're, we're still in sync. You know, because you don't want to be, you don't want to be tied to the mechanics of things. You don't, you don't want your imagination to be tied down by the mechanics of things either. But, um, you know, good film editors and actually Lee, who's our editor on, on all of Chris's movies. I, I first worked with him on a Peter Weir film where he was the sound editor. So he comes from sound, and, and, and the editors I work with really well are either, like Joe Walker, you know, who did 12 Years a Slave, and I just, I've just i just been working with on Widows for Steve McQueen. Um, he actually, he's actually, he started out as a film composer. So it's not just that, we discuss music, but there's a, you know, he has a, a rhythm, he has a, and it's more than a rhythm. There's a, there, there's a, there's a musical form of, of editing, you know, they, they, you know, so we, feel, we feel the story as rhythm. The scene we're going to see from Interstellar is a key scene. Uh, you say the, the, the nub of the movie is this relationship between the father and, and daughter. The, this is probably the most powerful scene in that, at least in the early, early part of the film, where Cooper, played by Matthew McConaughey, is saying goodbye to his daughter, Merv, uh, and his family before he goes off into space to uh, hopefully save humanity. I mean, this, this whole scene, this whole piece of music was just written as a piece of music. And actually, Chris and I were sort of going, we're not entirely sure what it can do. And Lee, the editor, just took it, laid it in, and it just did everything it was supposed to do. I, it never got changed, it never got touched, the cut never got touched. 
it's a long clip, but I think it's important that we see it from beginning to end because of how it builds and builds and builds. It's a nicely constructed scene. Actually, it doesn't have an ending. No. Which, you know, that's why I stopped writing. You know, I just, it's off, the ending is just abandoned. <laughs> Indeed it is. Here's the scene. You have to talk to me, Murph. I need to fix this before I go. I'll keep it broken so you have to stay. After you kids came along, your mom, she said something to me I never quite understood. She said, now, we're just here to be memories for our kids. Ghost didn't exist. That's right, Mark. Remember me. I can't be your ghost right now. I need to exist. They chose me. Murph, they chose me. You saw it. You're the one who led me to them. That's exactly why you can't go. I figured out the message. One word. You know what it is? Stay. It says, stay, Dad. Mark. You don't believe me. Look at the books. Look at this. It says stay. Why? You're not listening. It says stay. I'm coming back. When? One for you. One for me. When I'm up there in hypersleep. Or or traveling near the speed of light, or near a black hole. Time's gonna change for me. There's gonna run more slowly. Now, when we get back, we're gonna compare. Time will run differently for us? Yeah. I mean, by the time I get back, we, we might even be the same age. You and me. What? Imagine that. I have no idea when you're coming back. No idea. Oh! Murph. Oh, don't, don't mind. Don't make me leave like this. Come on, Murph. Don't make me leave like this, Murph. Hey. I love you. Forever. You hear me? I love you forever. And I'm coming back. I'm coming back. Five. 
Main engine start. Four. Three. Two. One. Booster ignition and... When, uh, when we did that film live here in this hall, I think that scene is one of the loudest things that's ever happened in that hall. And that includes Led Zeppelin in 1970. It was absolutely extraordinary. And actually, people who were there, it was a kind of almost semi-religious experience for people. There was something about that, that film and also the music that it really did connect with well, people. Well, it's sort of rare that you actually get to use the... The, the, that immaculate pipe organ in this hall. It was yeah. actually Roger Sayers, who was the organist at Temple Church, who played all this, who, I, I remember him coming up to Chris and me and going, you know, it's a very, very good organ at the old hall. <laughs> <laughs> and like, okay. <laughs> and, and, you know, I mean, he, he was just, he was just incredible. You know? Well, that, that whole thing, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a typical similar stupidity. It's like, it's the lowest note on the organ and the highest note on the organ. And, you <laughs> know, very what can effective. we do in the middle? Very effective. Um, and on, on the subject of the, of the live performance, this, before I open the floor for, for questions, live performance has become a very important part of your life more recently in the last few years with your tour around, around the world. Uh, there's also the World of Hans Zimmer, which is an orchestral concert, which is now doing the rounds. Um, and, of course, the, the live performances of Gladiator and, and Interstellar. Um, that, that's an extraordinary thing, that it's, it's exploded. Um, and you've become, even though you always deny it, a bit of a rock star when it comes to being on the stage with your shows. Why did you decide to do that in the first place? And, oh, and God. How do you, what do you make of it all now? I had all these mates who are musicians and they're famous and I shall not drop their names right now. But they, they, they sort of sat me down and went, you know, there comes a moment in time, there comes a point where you have to look your audience in the eye. You can't hide behind the screen forever. And we don't give a shit about your stage fright and all this stuff. <laughs> and then actually I do have to drop one name. And then I, I was sort of, you know, they t started to talk me into it and I was still going, nah, I don't want to do this. Um, I'm, I'm terrified, or, uh, yeah, I, I, you know, whatever the excuses were, right? And then I, uh, Pharrell Williams was one of the people ganging up on me. And I remember him getting up and he's walking towards the door and he just turns around and he goes, hey, I'm playing the Grammys. Do you want to play guitar the Grammys for me? I was going, only an idiot would say no. Do you know what I mean? It's like, wow, okay, so, and, it was great because it wasn't me. It, you know, I, nobody gave a shit about me. It was about Pharrell, but he kept <laughs> eye contact with me throughout the whole performance just to make sure I'm all right. And I realized it was it was delicious. It was great fun, and it was and I, and I should just you know, as Johnny Ma said, just get over yourself. You know, <laughs> <laughs> that's a good so, imagination. So yeah, you know, and, and and I did Hammersmith because. It seemed it seemed a more set, you know I mean and literally I mean and, um, you know Harvey Goldsmith promoted who who I've known forever and uh, uh, you know I said to Harvey do you, well, do you think anybody will come he goes, yeah I think I think I'll be all right you know and um, yeah he was right you know <laughs> but, but but it literally, sounds ridiculous I mean, it yeah, sounds ridiculous like, to say you know, that doesn't because, it because because I had this I had you know I had this idea which was no images from the films and no conductor, because I, I, I wanted those musicians that I've been making music with forever, I wanted them to have, I wanted to take the wall away that a conductor inevitably creates, and I wanted them to have like an autonomous relationship with the audience, you know. I wanted them to be looked in, at into their eyes as well, and I wanted, I, I wanted to show off all those amazing people that had been working on these scores and you know nobody, nobody knew what they looked like and I just <laughs> I, I just wanted to celebrate them in a way before we see the last clip what is the last thing <laughs> well we'll come to it oh, um, okay. <laughs> what are you it it it's connected with this next, last question which is what are you working on 
right now? Uh, I can lie to you and say, I've just finished Widows with Steve McQueen. That's not what you want to hear. No. Um, I'm working on a new version of The Lion King. Um, the live action. The version. live action version. You don't know. I'm just. Trying, I'm not trying to answer it so correctly. You know, sometimes it sort of goes and it attaches to your question in a funny way. You know, sometimes the best things happen for all the wrong reasons. I didn't want to do the Lion King. I didn't want to do a fuzzy animal movie, but my <laughs> uh, uh, my daughter at the time, Zoe, was six years old, and I couldn't ever take her to premiere of a. Oh, let's go and see a Tony Scott movie with lots of, you know, let's go and see True Romance with everything blowing up. So I thought, oh, I'll do this so, so I can show off as a dad and take my daughter to the premiere. Um, and then I'm working on this thing and I'm, I'm you know, I think it's going to just be a laugh and it's going to be easy. And then suddenly comes this thing that in the middle of the movie, the dad dies. And my father died when I was really young. And um, whatever you, whatever anybody tells you, there's no way children can actually cope with that. I mean, they, they all they do is they they suppress it, and they, you know. And suddenly, I found myself in front of a cartoon with fuzzy arms, having to confront this this sort of you know thing. Um, so yeah, I mean, it it became rather sort of an important part of. Growing up, I, uh, I suppose I grew up more than my daughter did during the process. <laughs> well, the clip is from The Lion King, oh. and uh, we we've chosen this because you might have noticed that uh, quite a lot of the clips tonight have been quite intense, actually. And this has got a nice, big, uplifting. Oh, good! Ending. So we go away with a smile on our faces. Uh, this is a, a, again a famous scene where uh, Simba sees his father in the water in a vision, uh, and his father has something to send him off with. And uh, so here it is, and uh, it's The Lion King, Oscar-winning score. That's not my father. It's just my reflection. No. Look hard. You see, he lives in you. I go back. I'm not who I used to be. Remember who you are. You are my son and the one true king. Remember who you are. No, please, don't leave me. Remember. Father. Remember. Was that <laughs> the weather? <laughs> Very peculiar, don't you think? Yeah. Looks like the winds are changing. Ah, uh, change is good. Yeah, but it's not easy. I know what I have to do, but going back means I'll have to face my past. I've been running from it for so long. Ow! Jeez, what was that for? It doesn't matter. It's in the past. <laughs> Yeah, but it still hurts. Oh, yes, the past can hurt. But the way I see it, you can either run from it or learn from it. Ah! You see? So what are you going to do? First, 
I'm gonna take your stick. No, 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 no! Not your stick! Hey! Where are you going? I'm going back! Ladies and gentlemen, thank you all very much for coming, but Hans, you are... Hang on, what? what's the score? One I don't... <laughs> what? Oh my god, one away oh, extra time. Oh, for fuck. Oh, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty... Oh my goodness gracious. Hans, we, everyone in here knows that you, you know, you're the busiest film composer on the planet. We really, really appreciate you giving up oh, your time lovely to come to be here, here today. Thank you so much. Ladies and gentlemen, Hans Zimmer.